Chapter Twenty Five. Where's Mama? There was somebody I had to tell off. Somebody who seemed to have started a tornado that was going on forever and ruining our lives. Dad and I had talked about it a lot, but things were still very tense, and I was so confused. Why did she have to come and start all this? Finally, I could hold in my anger no longer, and as soon as ballet class was over, I raced to Madame's office. I hate you, Madame, for all the mean things you said to my mom. Everything's been terrible ever since that day. You leave her alone from now on, or I'll go and never come back to see you. Did you fly all the way here just to make her sick? She can't dance now, and that's bad enough. If you don't stop causing so much trouble, I'll quit dancing too. I'll run away, and you'll never see me again. For in ruining my parents' lives, you have managed to ruin not only theirs but mine and Bart's too. She paled and looked very old. You sound so very much like your father. Julian used to blaze his dark eyes at me in the same way. I used to love you. Used to love me? Yes, used to. When I thought you cared about me, about my parents, then I believed that dancing was the most wonderful thing in the world. Now I don't believe. She looked stricken as if I'd stabbed her in her heart. She reeled back against the wall and would have fallen if I hadn't stepped forward to support her. Shorty, please," she gasped. "Don't ever run away. Don't stop dancing. If you do, then my life has been meaningless, and George will have lived for nothing, and Julian too. Don't take everything from those I have loved and lost. I couldn't speak. I was so confused, so I ran. Ran like Bart always ran when things got too heavy. Behind me, Melody called out, "Jory, where are you going in such a hurry? We were going to have a soda together." I ran on. I didn't care any more about anyone or anything. My life was all screwed up. My parents weren't married. How could they be? What minister or judge would marry a brother and his sister? Once I hit the sidewalk, I slowed down, then went on to a public park where I sat down on a green bench. On and on I sat, staring down at my feet, a dancer's feet, strong, tough with calluses, ready for the professional stage. What would I do now when I grew up? I didn't really want to be a doctor, though I'd said that a few times just to please the man I loved as a father. What a joke! Why should I try and lie to myself? There was no life for me without dancing. When I punished Madame, my mother, my stepdad, it was really only my uncle. I punished myself even worse. I stood up and looked around at all the old people sitting lonely in the park, wondering if one day I'd be like them. And I thought, No, I'll know when to say I made a mistake, when to say I'm sorry. Madame M was in her office, her head bowed down into her thin hands. When I opened the door quietly and stepped inside her office, I must have made some noise, for she looked up and I saw tears in her eyes. Joy flooded them when she saw me, but she didn't mention all that had happened half an hour ago. I have a gift for your mother," she said in her naturally shrill voice. She slid open a desk drawer and withdrew a gold box bound with red satin ribbon. For Catherine," she said stiffly, not meeting my eyes. "You are right about everything. I was ready to take you from your mother and father because I felt I was doing the right thing for you. I see now I was doing what I wanted for myself, not for you. Sons belong with their mothers, not their grandmothers." She smiled bitterly as she looked at the pretty gold box. "Lady Godiva Candy." The kind your mother was nuts about when she lived in New York and was with Madame Zolter's company. Then she couldn't eat chocolates for fear of adding weight, though she was the kind of dancer who burned off more calories than most when she danced. Still, I allowed her only one piece of candy a week. Now that she won't dance again, she can indulge to her heart's desire. That was Bart's phrase. Mom has an awful cold. 
I explained, just as stiffly as she had. Thank you for the candy and what you just said. I know Mom will feel better, knowing you won't try and take me away from her. I grinned then and kissed her dry cheek. Besides, don't you realize there is enough of me to share? If you aren't stingy, she won't be. Mom is wonderful. Not once has she ever told me you and she had any difficulties. I settled down in her single office chair and crossed my legs. Madame, I'm scared. Things are going crazy in our house. Bart acts weirder each day. Mom is sick with that cold. Dad seems so unhappy. Clover is dead. Emma doesn't smile any more. Christmas is coming and nothing is being done about it. If this keeps up, I think I'll crack up myself. Ha! She snorted, back to her old self. Life is always like that. Twenty minutes of misery for every two seconds of joy. So be everlastingly grateful for those rare two seconds. And appreciate. Appreciate what good you can find, no matter what the cost. My smiles were false. Underneath, I was truly depressed. Her cynical words didn't really help. Does it have to be that way? I asked. Jury, she said, thrusting her old pastry dough face closer to mine. Think about this. If there were no shadows, how could we see the sunlight? I sat there in a gloomy office and allowed this kind of sour philosophy to give me some peace. Okay, I get your meaning, madame. And if you can't say you're sorry, then I can. She whispered as if hurt. I'm sorry, too. I hugged her close, and we had come to some sort of compromise. All the way home, I held the gold box of chocolates on my lap, dying to open it. Dad, I began falteringly, Madame is sending Mom this candy as a reconciliation gift, I guess. He threw me a glance and a smile. That's nice. I think it's terribly strange Mom is staying sick with that cold for so long. She's never been sick more than a day or two. Don't you think she looks very tired? It's that writing, that damned writing, he grouched, watching the heavy traffic, turning on the windshield wipers, leaning forward to peer more closely at the traffic signal to the right. I wish it would stop raining. Rain always bothers her. Then she's up till four in the morning, next day up at dawn to scribble on legal pads, afraid to use the typewriter for fear of waking me. When the candle is burned at both ends, something has to give, and that's her health. First that fall, now this cold. He gave me another sideways glance. Then there's Bart and his problems, and you and yours. Jory, you know our secret now. Your mother and I have talked it over, and you and I have talked about it for hours and hours. Can you forgive us? Haven't I managed to help you understand? I bowed my head and felt ashamed. I'm trying to understand. Trying? Is it that difficult? Haven't I told you how it was with us, up there, all four of us in one room, growing up, finding out in our adolescence that we had only each other? But, Dad, when you ran away and found a new home with Dr. Paul, couldn't you have found someone else? Why did it have to be her? Sighing, he set his lips. I thought I explained to you how I felt then about women. Your mother was there when I needed her. Our own mother had betrayed us. When you're young, you fix very strong ideas in your mind. I'm sorry if you've been hurt by my inability to love anyone but her. What was there for me to say? I couldn't understand. The world was full of beautiful young women, thousands, millions. Then I thought of Melody. If she were to die, could I go out and find another? I thought and thought about that as Dad turned silent and his lips stayed in that grim line and the rain came down, down, driving hard. It was as if he could read my mind. For yes, if ever I was so unfortunate to lose Melody, 
If she moved away and I never saw her again, I'd go on living, and eventually I'd find another to take her place. Anything was better than— Jury, I know what you're thinking. I've had years and years to think about why it had to be my sister and no one else. Perhaps it was because I'd lost faith in all women because of what our mother was doing to us, and only my sister could give me comfort. She was the one who kept me from falling apart during those long years of deprivations. She was the one who made of that one room a whole house. She was a mother to Corey and Carrie. She made that room seem a home, making the table pretty, making the beds, scrubbing clothes in the bathroom tub, hanging them in the attic to dry. But more than anything, it was the way she danced in the attic that made me love her and put her in my heart forever. For it seemed as I stood in the shadows and watched her, she was dancing only for me. I thought she was making me the prince of her dreams as I made her the princess of mine. I was romantic then, even more so than she. Your mother is made of different stuff than most women, Jory. She could live on hate and still flourish. I couldn't. I had to have love or die. When we escaped Foxworth Hall, she flirted with Paul, wanting him to take her from me. She married your father when Paul's sister Amanda told her a lie. She was a good wife to your father, but after he was killed, she ran to the mountains of Virginia to complete her plans for revenge, which included stealing her mother's second husband. As you have found out, Bart is the son of my mother's husband. "'and not the son of Paul, as we told you and told him. "'We had to tell lies, then, to protect you. "'Then, after your mother married Paul and he died, she came to me. "'During all those years I waited, "'I somehow knew eventually she'd be mine "'as long as I held fast to my faith "'and kept the flame of my first love burning. "'It was so easy for her to love other men. "'It was impossible for me to find any woman who could compare.' She took me for her own when I was about your age, Jory. Be careful whom you love first, for that is the girl you will never forget. I let out a long withheld breath, thinking that life was not at all like fairy tale ballets or TV soap operas. Love did not come and go with the seasons as I'd kind of hoped it would. The drive home seemed to take forever. Dad was forced to drive very slowly and carefully. From time to time he flicked his eyes to the dashboard clock. I stared out of the windows. Everywhere there were Christmas decorations. Through picture windows I saw gaily lit Christmas trees. Longingly I stared at the windows we passed, seeing everything in that smeary way that made scenes ten times more romantic in the rain. I wished it was last year. I wished we had the happiness that had seemed so permanent then. I wished that old woman next door had never come into our lives and messed up what I thought was perfect. I wished, too, that Madame M. had never flown here to snoop in their lives and reveal all their secrets better left hidden. Worst of all, those two women had destroyed the pride I had for my parents. Try as I might, I still resented what they were doing, what they had done, risking scandal— "'risking ruining my life and Bart's, Cindy's too, "'and all because one man couldn't find another woman to love. "'And that one woman must have done something "'to keep him faithful and hoping. "'Jury,' began Dad as he turned into our driveway, "'from time to time I hear your mother complain about chapters she's misplaced. "'Your mother isn't the kind of woman to be careless "'in any important work project.' "'I'm presuming you've been slipping her completed chapters out of her desk drawer and reading them. "'Should I tell him the truth? "'Bart was the one who first stole pages from her script. "'And yet my sense of morality hadn't kept me from reading them too, "'though as yet I hadn't read to the end. "'For some reason I couldn't force myself to read beyond the time "'when first a brother betrayed his sister by forcing himself upon her.' "'that this man beside me could rape his own sister "'when she was only fifteen was beyond my comprehension, "'beyond my ability to sympathise, "'no matter how desperate his need had been "'or what the circumstances had been "'to drive him to commit such an unholy act. 
and certainly she shouldn't tell the whole world. Jory, have I lost you? I slowly turn my eyes his way, feeling sick and weak inside, wanting to hide from the torment I plainly saw on his face. Yet I couldn't say yes or no. I guess you don't need to answer, said Dad in a tight way. Your silence gives your answer, and I'm sorry. I love you as my own son, and I hoped you loved me enough to understand. We were going to tell you when we thought you were old enough to empathize with us. Cathy should have locked her first drafts in a drawer, and not trusted two sons to remain uninterested. It's fiction, isn't it? I asked hopefully. Sure, I know it is. No mother could do that to her own children. And I threw open the passenger door and was racing to the house before he could answer. My lips parted to call out to Mom. Then I shut my mouth and said nothing. It was easier for me to avoid her. Usually, when I came home, I dashed out into the garden and ran around doing practice leaps and positions. And on rainy days like this, I spent more time at the bar. Today, I threw myself in front of the television set in the family room, pushed the remote control button, and lost myself in a silly but entertaining soap opera. Kathy. Called Dad as he came in. Where are you? Why hadn't he sung out, "Come greet me with kisses if you love me"? Did he feel silly, guilty saying that now that he knew we knew where that line came from? Have you said hello to your mother? He asked as he came in. Haven't seen her. Where's Bart? Haven't looked for him. He threw me a pleading look, then went on into the bedroom he shared with his wife. Kathy, Kathy, I could hear him calling. Where are you? A few seconds later, he was in the kitchen behind me, checking there and not finding her. He began to race around from room to room and finally banged on Bart's locked door. Bart, are you in there? First a long silence, then came a reluctant, surly reply. Yeah, I'm in here. Where else would I be with the door locked? And unlock it and come out. Mama locked me in from the outside, so I can't come out. I sat on, immersing myself in the show, keeping myself detached, wondering how I was going to survive and grow up normally when I felt so unhappy. Dad was the type to have duplicate keys to everything, and soon Bart was out and undergoing a third degree. What did you do to cause your mother to lock you up and then go away? Didn't do nothing. You must have done something that made her furious. Bart grinned at him slyly, saying nothing. I looked their way, feeling anxious and scared. Bart, if you have done anything to harm your mother, you won't get out of this lightly. I mean that. Wouldn't do nothing to hurt her," said Bart irritably. "She's the one always hurting me. She don't love me, only Cindy. Cindy," said Dad. Suddenly remembering the little girl, and away he strode to her pretty room. He showed up minutes later with her. Where is your mother, Bart? How do I know she locked me up? Despite myself, I was losing my ability to stay uninvolved. Dad, Mom left her car in the garage a few days ago, and Madame drove us home the rest of the way, so she couldn't have gone far. I know she told me something wrong with her brakes. He threw Bart a long, scrutinizing look. Bart, are you sure you don't know where your mother is? Can't look through solid doors. Did she tell you where she was going? Nobody ever tells me nothing. Suddenly, Cindy piped up. Mummy went out in rain. Rain got us all wet. Bart whirled around to stab her with his glare. She froze and began to tremble. Smiling, Dad picked up Cindy again and sat down to hold her on his lap. Cindy, you're a lifesaver. Now think back carefully and tell me where Mommy went. Trembling more, she sat staring at Bart and unable to speak. Please, Cindy, look at me, not Bart. I'm here. I'll take care of you. Bart can't hurt you when I'm here. Bart, stop scowling at your sister. 
Cindy ran out in the rain, Daddy, and Mama had to chase outside and catch her. And then she came in dripping water and coughing, and I said something, and she got mad at me and shoved me in my room and slammed the door. Well, I guess that explains Cindy's tangled hair, said Dad. But he didn't look relieved. He put Cindy on her feet and began to make a series of phone calls to all Mom's friends and Madame Marisha. My grandmother said she'd drive right over. And then he was talking to Emma, who couldn't return until tomorrow because of the storm. I thought of my grandmother on the road trying to drive here in the downpour. Even in perfect weather, she wasn't what I'd call a safe driver. "'Dad, let's check all the rooms, even the attic,' I said, jumping up and running toward the linen closet. "'She may have gone up there to dance, like she does sometimes, and accidentally locked herself in, or fallen asleep on one of those beds, or something.' I concluded this lamely, thinking he was looking at me in an odd way. When Dad started to follow me up the attic stairs, Cindy let out a loud wail of fright. Quickly he returned to the hall and picked her up as if to take her with us. Bart pulled out a new pocket knife and began to whittle on a long tree branch. It seemed he was going to skin off all the tree bark and make a smooth switch. Cindy couldn't take her eyes off of that knife or switch. Dad, Cindy, and me looked all over our house, in the attic, in the closets, under the beds, everywhere. Mum was nowhere to be found. "'It's just not like Cathy to do anything like this,' Dad said worriedly. "'Especially I know she wouldn't leave Cindy alone with Bart. Something is very wrong.' "'Yeah,' I thought. "'If there was a fish in the house, it was watching us and whittling away on a limb that should be used on his bare bottom.' Dad, I whispered, as he stood in the middle of his bedroom again, looking around with bleak eyes. Why don't we presume Bart knows where she's gone? He's not the most honest kid ever born. You know how crazy he's been acting lately. We set off together, Dad still carrying Cindy, and hunted now for Bart. Now we couldn't find him. He was gone. Dad and I stared at each other. He shook his head. I stared around, knowing Bart had to be hiding behind a chair, or was crouched down low in some corner that was dim, or perhaps out in the rain acting like an animal. But the storm was getting worse. His cave in the hedges wouldn't keep him dry. Even Bart had more sense than to stay out in the cold and wet. My thoughts in a turmoil, I felt wild inside, like the storm. I hadn't done anything to deserve all this trouble, yet I was in the midst of it. "'suffering along with Dad, with Mom, with Cindy, and maybe Bart, too. "'Are you hating me now, Jory?' asked Dad, looking at me squarely. "'Are wheels churning in your head, saying your mother and I brought this all on ourselves "'and we deserve to pay the price? "'Are you thinking you shouldn't have to pay any price? "'If that's what you're thinking, I'm thinking the same thing.' Maybe your mother's life would have turned out better, and yours and Bart's, too, if I had gone away and left her to live in Paul's home until she found another man. But I still loved her. I love her now, tomorrow, and forever. God help me for not being able to think about life without her. Dully, I turned away. So that was what everlasting, burning love was like. "'destroying everything that got in its way. "'On my bed I lay down and sobbed. "'Finally I sat up and wondered again where Mom was. "'For the first time it really hit me she might be in danger. "'She wouldn't leave Dad. "'Something terrible must have happened or she'd be here, "'setting the table as she did every Thursday when Emma had her day off. "'Thursdays were very special to them "'for reasons I was just beginning to understand.' Thursday, the day the maids of Foxworth Hall went into the city, Thursday, the day Mom and Dad could climb out the attic dormer window and lie on the roof and talk, and as they talked, as they looked at each other in their high and lonely place, they fell mindlessly, uncontrollably in love. For now I knew why Mom had married one man after another, trying always to escape the sinful love she felt too. I got up, decided. It was up to me to find Bart. When I found Bart, 
I'd find my mother. Chapter 26 My Attic Souvenirs In the huge kitchen of the mansion, John Amos had everything under control. The maids and cook were scurrying about. Madame had to leave early, he told them. Now you are to pack up what clothes she'll need for her trip to Hawaii and be quick about it. Lottie, I want you to drive her bags to the airport and put them on the plane. Don't just stand there and stare at me with your blank face looking so stupid you understand English. Do as I say. Boy, he could act mean when he wanted to. They scattered like scared birds, one this way, one that. And then we were alone and he was grinning at me with his cracked teeth. How did your end go? Just like the movies, him and me. I swallowed over some lump that stayed in my throat and wouldn't go away. They don't know where Mama is. They're worried and keep asking, where is she? Never mind about them, he said in his funny old voice that made me wonder why God had chosen him for such a special job. I'll take care of everything until God sends his signal that your mother and grandmother have been redeemed and saved from hell fires. You just go home and keep quiet. Fire in my mind, growing bigger, hotter. You told me my mamma would be my attic souvenir, and now you won't even tell me where you put her. I've looked in the attic and they're not up there. You tell me where they are or I'll go home and tell my daddy what you've done. What I've done? he asked with a curling sneer. It's what you have done, Bart Winslow Sheffield. Do you think for one moment, with your violent psychiatric history, that you can be believed and not blamed? The law will take you and find you guilty, and you will be locked away. When he saw the red Malcolm anger in my eyes, he tried to smile. Come now, Bart, I was only testing you, trying to see if you'd break and lose your courage. But you're strong and full of the righteous power, the same as your great-grandfather Malcolm. Every power he had you have. And now is your chance to use those powers. For now, you'll be in charge of the adults, your mother and grandmother. You will control their lives, and feed them, if you will, or let them starve, if you are so inclined. But you have to be careful. You must keep them a secret until, well, remember always your father and brother will be suspicious and they may betray you if you give them the least hint of what you're up to. People always suspected me. If something was broken, it was always my fault. If the toilet stopped up and overflowed, it was always because I'd thrown down too much paper. If Mama lost her jewelry, that was my fault, too. Whatever bad thing happened in our house, they said it was my fault. I'd show them now how wrong it was for them not to love me. "'Bread and water,' I said. "'Bread and water is good enough for women who are unfaithful to husbands and sons.' "'Fine, fine,' mumbled John Amos. "'Down, down the narrow cellar steps John Amos led me, carrying a small flashlight. "'Made eerie shadows on the walls, felt clammy. "'Long time ago, when this house belonged to Jory and me, we'd found every nook, every cranny. "'But this was where ghosts lived.' where I'd never felt comfortable, so I stayed close at the heels of John Amos, terrified if he moved more than a yard ahead of me. "'They look down here,' I whispered, scared of waking up things that might be sleeping. "'No, they won't look where I have them hid,' answered John Amos. He chortled. <laughs> "'Your father will be sure they are in the attic, and why not? That would be the perfect revenge.' But they'll never, never find the snug little cage the workmen made when they put up a new brick wall to reinforce the wine cellar. Wine cellar? Didn't sound nearly as good as the attic. It wasn't nearly as scary, but it was very cold and dark down here. John Amos began brushing away spider webs. Then he shoved old furniture aside and finally came to a board door that was very hard to open. Now, you go in and peek through the little door at the bottom of that door over there, he said. We used to have a stray kitten your grandmother took in, but it disappeared shortly after you started coming over here. She had me cut this little door in the larger one, 
so the cat could come and go when it wanted to. With the flashlight held beneath his chin, it looked like something dead and dug up. Didn't trust him not to slam the door shut behind me, and I'd never be able to wiggle through that little kitty door. No. You go in the wine cellar first, I ordered like Malcolm would. For a moment he didn't move. Maybe he thought I might slam the door behind him. Then he gave me a long look before he went slowly into the wine cellar. He put the flashlight on one of the wine racks while he tugged and tugged at the back rack, holding many dusty old wine bottles. Finally it creaked open. It smelled bad in there. I held my nose and stared, and then stared some more. John Amos held his flashlight high so I could see the two women prisoners better. Oh, oh, Mama, Grandmother, how pitiful my Mama looked lying on the damp concrete with her head held on my grandmother's lap. Both of them raised their hands to shield their eyes from the bright light come so suddenly into their dark, evil cell. I could barely see it was so dim. Who is it? asked my mamma weakly. Chris, is that you? Have you found us? Was my mamma blind now? How could she think John Amos was my daddy? If my mamma went blind and crazy too, would God think that enough punishment? My grandmother spoke up. John, I know that's you. You let us out of here this minute, do you hear me? Let us out immediately. John Amos laughed. I didn't know what to do, but Malcolm came in my brain and told me. You give me the key, John Amos, I ordered sternly. You go up the stairs and let me give the prisoners their bread and water. Wonder why he obeyed. Did he really think I was as strong as Malcolm? I watched until he was out of sight, then I ran to bolt another door so he couldn't sneak up behind me. Feeling more like Malcolm than like Bart, I crept on my hands and knees, shoving along the silver tray with its half loaf of bread and its silver pitcher of water. It didn't seem to me funny to be serving prison meals from a silver tray, for that's the way my grandmother always did things, elegantly. The big door was shut now. It appeared only another of the wine shelves full of dusty old bottles. Flat on my stomach, I reached under the lower shelf and opened the little door that would swing inward or outward. Wonder why the kitten liked it back in the darkest part. Bread, water, I said in a hard, gruff voice and quickly shoved in the tray. I slammed the little door shut and picked up a brick to wedge it so they couldn't see me if they pushed. I stayed to spy on them. I heard my mother moaning and crying out for Chris. Then she surprised me. Mama, where has Mama gone, Chris? It's been so long since she visited us. Months, months, and the twins don't grow. Kathy, Kathy, my poor darling, stop thinking about the past, said my grandmother. Please hold on. Eat and drink to keep up your strength. Chris will come to save us both. Cory, stop playing that same tune over and over. I'm so tired of your lyrics. Why do you write such sad songs? The night will end, it will. Chris, tell Cory the day will begin soon. I heard sobs then from my grandmother. Oh, my God, she cried. Is this the way it's going to end? Can't I do anything right? This time I was so sure I could work it out. Please, God, don't let me fail all of them, please. I listened to her pray out loud, praying for my mother to get well, for her son to come and find them before it was too late. Over and over she said the same words as my mother asked crazy questions. I sat and listened for a long time. Legs got cramped and uncomfortable got old and weary inside like I was locked up in there with them, crazy too, hungry, hurting, dying. Going now, I said in a whisper. Don't like this place. Nobody was home and it was dark. Now I could run to the refrigerator and steal the food. 
I was stuffing in another ham slice when Madame Marisha opened the door from the garage and stalked into the kitchen. "'Good evening, Bart,' she said. "'There's your father and Jory.' I shrugged. Nobody told me nothing. Didn't know why Daddy and Jory would go off and leave Cindy alone with me. Then Emma was calling out from another room. "'Hello, Madame Marisha. Dr. Sheffield told me you were due here any moment. I'm sorry you went to so much trouble. Once I knew Cathy had disappeared, I couldn't stay away. I have to know what's happened to her, and she was so sick, so feverish. I should have known better than to leave her.' And Emma saw me. "'Bart, you wicked little boy! How dare you add to your father's worries by disappearing, too! You are a bad boy, and I'll bet my life you know something about where your mother is!' Both old women glared at me, hating me with their mean, mean eyes. I ran. Ran from knowing soon I'd be crying, and I couldn't let anybody see me cry, now that I had to act just like Malcolm, the heartless. Chapter 27 The Search The night was not fit for man nor beast. It was raining like when Noah was building his ark. The wind howled and shrieked and was trying to tell us something, like wild music that would destroy your brain. I kept pace with Dad, though that wasn't easy, since I'd yet to grow legs as long as his. His hands were balled into fists. I fisted mine, too ready to do battle beside him when the need arose. "'Jory,' said Dad, striding on without pausing, "'how often does Bart come over here?' We'd reached the black iron gates by this time. Then he leaned to speak into the box which sent his voice into the house. "'I don't know,' I said miserably. "'Bart used to trust me, but now he doesn't trust anybody, so he doesn't tell me what he does any more.' "'Slowly,' Slowly the black gates swung open. They seemed like black skeleton hands welcoming us into our graves. I shivered, thinking I was getting as morbid as Bart. I had to run then to keep up with Dad. "'I've got to say something!' I yelled so I could be heard above the wind. "'When I first found out you were Mom's brother and our own uncle, I thought I hated you and her too.' I thought I could never forgive either one of you for making me so ashamed, so disappointed. I thought I'd dry up inside and never love or trust anyone again. But now that Mom's gone, I know I'll always love her and you. I can't hate either one of you, even if I want to. In the hard driving rain, in the dark, he turned to clasp me against his chest, his hand pressing my head against his heart. I think I heard him sob. Jory, you don't know how much I've longed to hear you say you don't hate me or your mother. I always hoped you'd understand when we told you, and we were going to tell you when you were older. We thought, perhaps foolishly, that we needed to wait a few more years. But now that you have found out on your own and you can still love us, maybe later on you will come to understand. I drew closer to Dad as we continued on our way to the shadowy mansion. I felt a new bond had developed between us that was stronger than what we'd had before. In a way, he was more my father, because he had much of my own kind of blood. Blood of my blood, I thought, my own uncle and Bart's, though I'd always thought he was Bart's uncle, and that had made me a little jealous. Now I could lay claim to him, too. But why hadn't they realized I was mature for my age? And I would have understood when they told me Mom had an affair with Bart's father. I would have. I think. We reached the steps. Before Dad could bang on the door knocker, the left side of the double doors swung open, and there stood that butler, John Amos Jackson. I'm packing, he said in way of greeting, scowled up and ugly looking, and my wife has gone to Hawaii. I have a million things to take care of here without entertaining the neighbors. I plan to join her as soon as I'm done here. "'Your wife?' bellowed Dad, his astonishment so clear it slapped me too. Something smug came and went in the butler's watery eyes. "'Yes, Dr. Christopher Sheffield, Mrs. Winslow is now married to me.' 
I thought Dad would fall from shock. I want to see her, and I don't believe you. She'd be out of her mind to marry you. I don't lie, said that grim, ugly butler, and she is out of her mind. Some women can't live without a man to run their affairs, and that's what I am, someone to lean on. I don't believe you, stormed my dad. Where is she? Where is my wife? Have you seen her? The butler smiled. Your wife, sir? I have enough to do keeping up with my own wife without looking out for yours. Yesterday my wife railed about this terrible weather and took off with one of our maids. She told me to join her later, after I'd arranged to close up this house. And after all the trouble and expense she went to, having this place redecorated and refurbished, now she wants to move. Dad stood staring at John Amos Jackson. I thought we'd leave then, but Dad seemed rooted. You know who I am, don't you, John? Don't deny it. I see it in your eyes. You are the butler who made love to the maid Livy while I lay on the floor behind the sofa and heard you tell her about the arsenic on the sugared doughnuts meant to kill the attic mice. I don't know what you're talking about, denied the butler while I looked from him back to Dad. Oh, I should have finished every page of Mum's manuscript. Things were even more complicated than I'd realized. John, perhaps you are married to my mother and perhaps you are lying. Regardless, I think you know what has happened to my wife, and now I'm concerned about my mother as well, so get out of my way. I'm going to search this house from top to bottom. The butler paled. You can't come over here and tell me what to do, he muttered indistinctly. I could call the police. But you won't, and if you want to, go ahead, call them. I'm going to search now, John. There's nothing you can do to stop me. The old butler shuffled away, shrugging helplessly. "'Go on, then. Have your way, but you won't find anything.' Together, Dad and I searched. I knew the house much better than he did. All the closets, the secret places. Dad kept saying the attic was where they would be, but when we were up there and looking there was nothing but junk and dusty clutter. Again we returned to the parlour where the woman he called Mother had her hard wooden rocker, which I sat in and found quite uncomfortable. Restlessly, Dad prowled the room, then paused in the archway that led to the adjacent room, that parlour where the huge oil portrait hung. If Cathy came over here, she would have seen that, and she could have come if Bart told her something. Rocking back and forth in the chair, I made it walk a little closer to the fire that was guttering out. Something crunched beneath one of the rockers. Dad heard the sound and bent to pick up an object. It was a pearl. He tested it between his teeth and smiled bitterly. My mother's string of pearls with a butterfly clasp. She always wore them, just as our grandmother always wore her diamond brooch. I don't believe my mother would go anywhere without those pearls. Another hour of searching the house and questioning the Mexican maid and cook who did not understand English very well, and both he and I were frustrated. "'I'll be back, John Amos Jackson,' said Dad as he opened the front door, "'and the next time I'll have the police with me.' "'Have it your way, doctor,' said the butler with a tight, malicious smile. "'Dad, we can't notify the police, can we? "'We will if we have to. "'But let's wait at least until tomorrow. "'He wouldn't dare harm Cathy or my mother, "'or he'd land up behind bars. "'Dad!' I'll bet Bart knows what is going on. He and John Amos are very thick. I explained then how Bart was always talking to himself whenever he believed he was alone. He talked in his sleep, too, and when he stalked around playing pretend games. It seemed the most important part of Bart's life was spent alone talking to himself. All right, Jory, I understand what you're saying. I have an idea I hope works. This may well be the most important part you've ever played, so pay attention. Tomorrow morning you are only to pretend to go to school. I let you out as soon as we turn the corner onto the highway. You run back home and make sure Bart doesn't see you. I'll try to find out if my mother really flew to Hawaii, and if she really married that horrible old man.
Chapter 28 Whispering Voices Questions, questions. All they did was ask me questions. Didn't know nothing, nothing. Wasn't guilty, wasn't. Why ask me? Crazy kids didn't give straight answers. Mama's gone cause she always hated me, even when I was a little baby. That night, whores, harlots, and strumpets came to dance in my head. Woke up, heard the rain beating on the roof, heard the wind blowing at my window. Fell asleep again and dreamed I was like Aunt Carrie, who didn't grow tall enough. Dreamed I prayed and prayed, and one day God let me grow so tall my head touched the sky. Looked down and saw all the little people running around like ants, afraid of me. I laughed and stepped in the ocean, making tidal waves rise up and wash over the tall cities. More pipsqueak screams. All the people I didn't squash were drowned. Sat in the ocean then that came to my waist and cried. My tears were so huge they made the ocean rise up again. And all I could see all around me was my reflection and how handsome I was now. Now that there wasn't a girl or woman left alive to love and admire me, I was handsome, tall, and strong. I told John Amos about my dreams. He nodded his head and told me he used to dream when he was young about girls, and how much he could love them if only they wouldn't see how long his nose was. I had other attributes I couldn't show them, but they never gave me a chance. Never a chance. Next morning, Jory left with Daddy. Easy to slip away from Emma and Madame Marisha, for they had to fool around with Cindy so much. But it gave me the chance to steal into the mansion next door. I sneaked around to find John Amos. He was packing all the beautiful lamps, paintings, and other valuables in boxes. The silver should be wrapped in tarnish-proof papers, he said to one of the maids. And be careful with that china and crystal. When the movers show up, have them put in the best furniture first, for I may be busy elsewhere. The prettiest maid was young, and she frowned. Mr. Jackson, why we go? Thought Madame liked it here. She never say we moving. Your mistress is a woman of changing moods. It's that nutty boy next door, that little one who keeps coming over here. He's gotten to be a real nuisance. He killed the dog she gave him. I suppose none of you know that. I stared in the room and saw the maid's lips part in horror. No, thought the dog went over to boy's home. The brat is dangerous. That's why madame has to move. He's threatened her life more than one time. He's under the care of a psychiatrist. They looked from one to the other and made circles above their heads. Mad. Mad as hell at John Amos, telling lies about me. Waited until he was alone, sitting at the fancy desk where my grandmother kept her checkbook. He jumped when I came in. Bart, I wish you wouldn't sneak around like that. Make some noise when you enter. Clear your throat. Cough. Do something to announce you are there. I heard what you told the maids. I'm not crazy. Of course you're not, he said, his S's hissing as always. But I do have to tell them something, don't I? Otherwise they might become suspicious. As it is, they think your grandmother has gone on a trip to Hawaii. I felt sick inside, standing there, towing in my sneakers and staring down at them. John Amos, can I give my mamma and granny sandwiches to eat today? No, they can't be hungry already. Knew he would say that. He forgot me then. He was reading over her bank books, her savings accounts, her receipts, and giggling to himself. He found a little key and opened a tiny drawer way back behind another door. Stupid woman! Thought I didn't notice where she hid her key. I left him having his fun with my granny's things, and I stole down to where my caged mice were. Made me feel better to think of them as only mice. My mamma was groaning, half crying from the cold. As I peeked inside and saw they had the little stub of candle lit, I'd shoved in the candle along with some matches so I could see what they were doing. Mama looked little and white, and still my granny held her head in her lap, 
and wiped her face with a rag she must have torn from her slip, for it had lace on one ragged edge. Cathy, my love, my only daughter left, please listen to me. I have to speak now, for I may never have another chance. Yes, I made mistakes. Yes, I allowed my father to torment me until I didn't know right from wrong or which way to turn. Yes, I put arsenic on your sugared doughnuts, thinking each one of you would get only a little sick. Then I could slip you out one by one. I didn't want one of you to die. I swear I loved you all four of you. I carried Corey out to my car where he breathed his last breath just as I laid him on the back seat and covered him with two blankets. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go to the police, and I was so ashamed, so guilty. She shook my mother while I trembled, too. Kathy, my daughter, please wake up and listen, she pleaded. Mama had awakened and seemed to be trying to focus her eyes. Darling, I don't think Bart killed the dog I gave him. He loved Apple. I think John did that, hoping Bart would be blamed and considered crazy and dangerous so the police would put the blame on Bart when you and I disappeared. I think John strangled Jory's little pet poodle, too, and killed my kitten as well. Bart is a very lonely, confused little boy, Kathy, but he's not dangerous. He likes to pretend he is, and in that way he can feel like he's going to be a powerful man. But it's John who is dangerous. He hates me. I didn't know until a few years ago that if I hadn't returned to Foxworth Hall after your father died, John would have inherited all the Foxworth fortune. My father trusted John as he trusted no one else, perhaps because they were so much alike. But when I came back, he forgot John. He wrote John out of his will and put me back in as his sole heir. Kathy, are you listening? Mama, is that you, Mama? asked my mother in a small voice that sounded like a child in trouble. Mama, why don't you look at the twins when you come in to see us? Why don't you notice that they don't grow as they should? Are you deliberately not seeing, just ignoring them so you won't feel guilty and ashamed? Oh, Kathy, cried Grandmother, if only you knew how much it hurts to hear you say those things after all these years. Did I hurt you so deeply you could never heal, you and Chris too? It's no wonder you and your brother... I'm sorry, so sorry I could die. But in a moment or so she pulled herself together and went on with what she called a desperate urgency. Even if you are delirious and can't fully understand now, I must speak or I may not live to tell you everything. When John Amos was a young man, about twenty-five, he lost it after me, though I was only ten. He'd hide in corners and spy on me, then hurry to my father and make the worst of innocent deeds on my part. I couldn't tell my parents that John told lies, for they never believed me. They believed him. They refused to recognize a young girl is often preyed upon by older men, even older relatives. John was third cousin to my mother, the only member of her family my father could stand. I think my father put it in his head after my older two brothers died that if ever I fell out of his favor, John would benefit. That was my father's way of extracting the most out of everyone, dangling his sugar plums that would vanish when reached for. John wanted my mother's wealth, too. They encouraged him to think he might inherit. They thought him a saint. He wore a pious look all the time he acted godly, and all the while he was seducing every pretty young maid who ever came into Foxworth Hall. And my parents never suspected. They couldn't see any evil but what their children did. Can you understand now why John hates me, why he hated my children too? He would have been the beneficiary if I had stayed in Gladstone. One day I heard him in the back hall whispering to Bart, your son, that I used my feminine wiles to cajole my father into disinheriting the only man who was his friend, his best confidant. Grandmother began to cry then. I shriveled up tight, hurting deep inside from all I was finding out. Malcolm, were you evil too? Who was I to trust now? 
Was John Amos just as conniving with his masculine wiles as my granny was with her feminine ones? Was everybody just as wicked as my granny and mamma? Was God on my side, on her side, or John's? Mamma, are you still there, Mamma? Yes, darling, I'm still here. I'll stay and take care of you as I never took care of you before. This time I'll be the mother I should have been before. This time I'll save you and Chris. Who are you? demanded my mother, bolting up again and shoving my grandmother away. Oh, she screamed, it's you. You weren't satisfied just to kill Corey and Carrie. Now you've come back to kill me too. Then you'll have Chris all to yourself. All yours. All yours. She broke then and cried. Then she began to scream like she was crazy, shrieking out over and over again how much she hated her mother. Why don't you die, Corinne Foxworth? Why don't you die? Went away. Couldn't stand any more of that. They were both evil. But why was this hurting so much? Chapter 29 Detective Just as Dad and I had planned, early the next morning Dad drove me off towards school, then he let me out on the road that led to our house. Now take it easy, Jory. Don't do anything that will endanger your life, and don't let Bard or that butler know what you're up to. They could be dangerous, remember that. He hugged me close, as if afraid I might be foolhardy. Listen carefully to me now. I'm going to see Bart's psychiatrist this morning so I can tell him what has happened. Then I'm checking the airports to see if my mother has flown anywhere, though God knows that's not likely. But for both women to disappear in the same day is just too much of a coincidence. I had to say it. As much as I dreaded hearing the words come from my own lips, I had to speak. Dad, have you considered that Bart might have... Well, you know... Clover was strangled with wire. Apple was starved and then stabbed with a pitchfork. Who knows what he might do next? He patted my shoulder. Yes, of course I've thought of that. But I can't picture Bart overcoming your mother. She's very strong, even if she does have a cold. That's what worries me most, Jory. She had a temperature of 100, and fevers do make a person weaker. I should have stayed home to take care of her. A woman is a fool to marry a doctor, he concluded bitterly as if he'd forgotten I was there, and all the while his motor was purring softly. He bowed his head down on his hands that held the steering wheel. Dad, you go on and do what you can to check the airlines. I'll handle everything here. And I added with a big burst of overconfidence, And remember, Madam M is here. And you know how she is. Bart won't pull anything with her around. Smiling as if I'd given him the assurance he needed, he waved goodbye and drove off, leaving me standing there and wondering just what to do. The fierce rain of yesterday had dwindled to a slow drizzle that was miserable and cold but not wild. Home again, and I was hiding behind the shrubbery, all wet and dripping, as Bart sat in the kitchen and refused to eat his breakfast. "'Hate everything you cook,' he said sullenly. It was surprising to hear his voice coming to me so clearly. Then I smiled, not feeling spooked as I had before. It was the intercom system left on. Often delivery men came to our back door, rather than use the special drive that circled the front. Our breakfast nook wasn't too far from the panel on the wall with dozens of buttons. I remembered when our house was being constructed, our mom had wanted music in every room so housework won't seem such a bore. Then came Madame's strident voice. But What's wrong with your cereal? Don't like cereal with raisins. Then don't eat the raisins. They get in the way. Nonsense. If you don't eat breakfast, then you won't eat lunch either. And if you don't eat lunch, there will be no dinner. And one ten-year-old boy is going to bed very hungry. You can't starve me to death, Bart shrieked. This is my house. You don't belong here. You get out. I will not get out. I'm staying until your mother returns safely. 
And don't you dare raise your voice to me again, or I might turn you over my knee and paddle you behind until you scream for mercy. It won't hurt, he jeered, and it wouldn't. Spankings never bothered Bart, who had skin with no surface nerve endings. Thank you for telling me, said Madame with great aplomb. I will then think of a better punishment, such as keeping you indoors locked in your room. By this time I was peering in a window. There sat Bart with a secret smile on his face. Emma, ordered Madame, take Bart's plate away, take his bowl, his orange juice too. Bart, go straight to your room and don't let me hear another word out of you until you can come to this table and eat your meals without complaints. Witch, old black witch, come to live in our house, Bart chanted as he ambled away. But he didn't go to his room. He bolted out of the garage door when Madame wasn't looking, and from there he headed toward the garden wall and the old oak tree he could climb to take him over the wall. I ran as fast as I could, following him. But once I was inside the mansion, I lost sight of him. Where had Bart gone? I stared right and left, looked behind me, turned around slowly. Had he disappeared up the stairs or down into the cellar? I hated this house, with its maze of long corridors, with so many niches between the walls where Mom could be hidden. Usually a builder used the leftover spaces to make closets or put in shelves, but this one, I knew for a fact, had secret doors, only I'd already searched all the secret rooms, useless to look in them again. Suddenly I heard a footfall. Bart was right behind me. He looked right through me. His eyes glazed as he stared bleakly at nothing. I couldn't believe he didn't see me. I followed silently, believing he'd take me to where Mom and her mother were hidden. Unfortunately, he headed for home. Sickened, disheartened, I trailed along behind, feeling I'd betrayed my father and failed him. Lunchtime and Dad came home, tired and distressed looking. Any luck, Jory? No. How about you? None. My mother did not fly to Hawaii. I checked with all the airlines. Jory, both Kathy and my mother must be inside that house next door. I had an idea. Dad, why don't you have a long talk with Bart? Don't jump on him or condemn him. Just say nice things. Praise him for being nice to Cindy. Tell him how much you care about him. I know he's behind this, but he keeps mumbling about the Lord and being his dark angel of revenge. Dad couldn't find any words to say as he digested my information. Then, silently, he set off to find Bart and do what he could to make an unwanted little boy feel needed, if it wasn't already too late. Chapter 30 The Last Supper Later I went down to the cellar again with John Amos. Corinne? John Amos called softly as he bent over stiffly. Clumsy like me, he got down on his knees and peered through the small kitty door he opened. I want you and your daughter to know this is your last meal, so I made it a good one. He lifted the lid of the silver teapot and spat inside, then poured the steaming hot liquid into fine china cups. One for you, one for your daughter, he said. He shoved one cup and saucer inside the kitty door, then the other set. Next he picked up a plate of sandwiches, which looked stale and kind of dirty, then managed to drop the plate on the filthy cellar floor. He picked up the little triangles and wiped them off against his trouser leg, shoved the meat that had fallen out back in, then put the plate of coal-dusted food in through the kitty door. "'Here you are, Corin Foxworth,' snarled John Amos in his hissy voice. "'I hope you find these dainty sandwiches to your liking, you bitch. "'I took your word when you married me, truly believing you'd be my wife, "'and though you have never been my wife in the way I'd hoped,' Still, I will inherit what is rightfully mine. Finally, I have managed to destroy you and yours, just as Malcolm wanted to kill all your devil's issue. He 
Did he have to hate my granny so much? Maybe she wasn't to blame, like me who sometimes did bad things and couldn't help it. Why was everybody doing bad things to everybody else and calling the excuse inheritance? You flaunted your beauty before me, screamed out an enraged old man, tormenting me when you were a child, teasing me when you were an adolescent, thinking you could have your fun and I could never harm you. And then, when you married your half-uncle and came back to disinherit me, you treated me like I wasn't even there, just another piece of furniture to ignore. Well, are you arrogant now, Corinne Foxworth? Do you feel haughty, sitting in your own filth, holding your dying daughter's head on your filthy lap? I have made you crawl at last, haven't I? I have beaten you at your own game, stolen Bart's affection from you, made him mistrust you and trust me. You can't choose your charm and feminine wiles now. It's too late. I hate you now, Corinne Foxworth. For every woman I've fantasized with you, I have paid, but no longer. I have won, and though I'm seventy-three now, I will live on at least another five or six years in luxury enough to make up for all the years I've suffered at your hands. My grandmother was sobbing quietly. I was crying too, wondering again who was right, him or her. John Amos was saying terrible things. Nasty, evil, bad words that little boys wrote on bathroom walls. Grown-up old men shouldn't talk like that, and in front of my grandmother and my mamma. John, yelled grandmother, haven't you done enough? Let us out and I'll be your wife in the way you want, but please do not punish my daughter more. She's very sick. She needs to be in a hospital. The police will call this murder if you let her die and me too. John Amos just laughed and walked heavily back up the stairs. I couldn't move. I was so frozen, so confused I didn't know who was good and who was bad. Bart, screamed my grandmother. Run fast to your father and tell him where we are. Run, run. Bleary-eyed, I just stood there, didn't know what to do. Please, Bart, she begged, go tell your father where we are. Malcolm, was that him over in the corner, his ghost face frowning at me? Passing my smutty hand over my blurry eyes. Dark, so dark. I pretended to leave, but I snuck back. I wanted to hear more of the truth. Out of the darkness came my mother's thin voice, screaming at that old woman who was her mother, my grandmother. Oh, yes, mother, I understood everything you said. We didn't stand a chance, no matter who died and who didn't die, when you took us into Foxworth Hall and locked us away. Now, years later, we will die just because that crazy old butler didn't inherit the money he expected, promised to him years ago by a dead man. And if you believe any of that, you are just as crazy as he is. Kathy, don't deny the truth because you hate me so much. I'm telling you the truth. Can't you see how John has used your son, the son of my Bart? Don't you see how perfect his revenge is? To use the son of the man he hated, the man he felt took his place, when it could have been him who married me if my father could have forced me to do it? Oh, you don't know how father tried to tell me I owed it to John to marry him and allow him to have half of his fortune. He didn't guess, or maybe he did, that John wanted it all. And when you and I die, it won't be John who is found guilty, it will be Bart. It's John who killed Clover, then Apple. It's John who dreams of having Malcolm's power, Malcolm's wealth. It's not my imagination when I hear him mumbling to himself incessantly. Like Bart, mumbled Mama, so funny-sounding. Bart's always pretending he's old and feeble, but powerful and rich. Poor Bart. What about Jory? Has he got Jory? Where is Jory? Why did she pity me and not Jory? Got up and left. Was I crazy too, like him? Was I a killer at heart, like him? Didn't know nothing about myself. Was foggy-minded, hazy-seeing... But I did manage to move my heavy legs, and somehow I climbed up all those old stairs. Chapter 
Chapter 31 Waiting He was the only father I could remember well, and I loved him even more in that relationship. He held out his hand and told me what we had to do, and I followed, as I would have followed blindly anywhere he led. For out of every terrible situation something good had to come, and I knew now how much he meant to me. With Dad leading the way, we went once more to the house next door. We hadn't seen Bart all afternoon. How stupid of me to let him outsmart me and sneak away when I had my head turned, watching some cute things Cindy did as she tried to dance like me. Mom had been missing a full twenty-four hours. That old butler let us in, standing back to scowl at us. My mother has not flown to Hawaii, stated Dad, his blue eyes hard and cold. So? She is not an organized woman. She may have gone on to visit friends for the holidays. She has no friends here. You smoke expensive cigarettes, said my father dryly. I remember that night when I was seventeen, lying behind the sofa while you and Livy, the maid, were there, and you smoked the same cigarettes. French? Right, said John Amos Jackson with a sneering grin. Old Malcolm Neil Foxworth taste gave me the habit. You pattern yourself after my grandfather, don't you? Do I? Yes, I believe you do. When I checked this house the last time, I opened a closet full of expensive men's clothes. Yours? I am married to Corinne Foxworth. She is my wife. How did you blackmail her to marry you? Again the old man smiled. Some women have to have a man in the house or they don't feel safe. She married me for a companion. As you can see, she treats me like a servant still. I think not, said my father with his narrowed eyes sweeping over the butler who was wearing a new suit. I think you are thinking of your future when or if my mother should die. How interesting, replied John Amos Jackson, grinding out his stub of quickly smoked cigarette. I've made my departure plans. I'm flying back to Virginia, where I expect my wife will join me when she becomes tiresome to her hosts. Her daughter ruined her socially in Virginia years ago, which you must know, but still she will go there. Why? John Amos Jackson grinned widely. She is having Foxworth Hall reconstructed, Dr. Sheffield. From out of the ashes, Foxworth Hall shall rise again, like the fabled phoenix. Dad faltered, still staring at the cigarette. Foxworth Hall, he said in a haunted voice. How far along is it? Almost finished, answered John Amos Jackson smugly. Soon I shall reign as king where Malcolm ruled, and his arrogant, beautiful daughter will reign at my side. He laughed crazily, seeming to enjoy my father's discomfort. She'll have her facial scars reconstructed, her face lifted again. She'll colour her hair and make it blonde again, and she'll sit at the foot of my dining table. Behind me will stand one of my own cousins, where I used to stand. It will all be as it was before, except this time I shall be the lord and master. Wheels were churning in Dad's head. You will never rule anywhere but in prison, he said, before he turned and left. Dad, I said when we were home, did you believe what that butler told us? I don't know yet. I do know he's more clever than I thought. When I was a boy in Foxworth Hall, looking down on his bald head, I never suspected he had any power. He seemed just another servant. However, I can see now he laid his plan a long time ago and is now fulfilling his schedule for revenge. For revenge? Jory, can't you see that man is insane? You have told me that Bart imitates a man he calls Malcolm, who has been dead for years. But the man Bart is really imitating is John Amos Jackson who is himself imitating my grandfather, Malcolm Foxworth, dead and gone but still influencing our lives. How do you know? Did you ever see your grandfather? I saw him one time only, Jory, 
he said in a sad, reflective way. I was fourteen, your age. Your mother and I hid in a huge chest on the second floor and looked down in the ballroom, and Malcolm Foxworth was in a wheelchair. He was a far distance away, and I never heard his voice. But our mother used to come to us with descriptions of how he talked about sin and hell, quoting from the Bible, talking about hell and judgment day. Night came. We turned on all the lights, hoping that would light Mom home and Bart too. Emma and Madame put Cindy to bed early. Emma went from Cindy's room back into the kitchen, but Madame came into the family room and slouched in a chair across from Dad. Just about that time, Bart came in the door and crouched down in a corner. "'Where have you been so long?' asked Dad, sitting up straighter and fixing Bart with a strange, long look. Madame M. riveted her dark, ebony eyes on Bart, too. Bart ignored them and continued to make shadow pictures on the wall by holding his hands in contorted positions. The TV set behind me was turned on, though no one was watching. A choir of boys were singing Christmas carols. I felt exhausted from trying to follow Bart around all day. Exhausted more from worrying about Mom, to say nothing about what would happen to all of us. I decided I had to escape by going to bed and rose to say good night, but Madame put her finger before her lips and gestured to Dad so he too would pay attention to what Bart was muttering to himself as he made the eerie picture of an old man talking to a child. Bad things happen to those who defy the laws of God, he crooned in a hypnotizing way. Bad people who don't go to church on Sundays who don't take their children, who commit incestuous acts, will all go to hell and burn over the everlasting fires as demons torment their eternal souls. Bad people can be redeemed only by fire, saved from hell and the devil and his pitchfork only by fire. Fire! Weird, really weird. Dad could control his impatience and rage no longer. Bart! Who told you all that hocus-pocus? My brother jerked upright. His dark brown eyes went blank. Speak when spoken to, said the wise man to the innocent child. The child says in return, unholy people who commit sins will come to a fiery end. Who told you that? Old man from his grave. Old man likes me better than Jory who does sinful dancing. Old man hates dancers. Old man says only I am fit to rule in his place. Dad was listening intently. I was remembering what Bart's shrink had advised. Play along with the boy. Pretend to believe everything he says, no matter how ridiculous. Remember, he's only ten, and at that age a child can believe in almost anything. So let him express himself in the only safe way he's found so far. When the old man speaks, you are hearing your son speaking of what bothers him most. Bart, said Dad, listen to me carefully. If your mother didn't know how to swim, and she was drowning and I was there but looking the other way, would you tell me so I could jump in and save her? Any son should have said yes immediately, but Bart considered this heavily, frowning, weighing his answer when it should have come spontaneously. Finally, he answered, You wouldn't have to do anything to save Mama from drowning, Daddy, if Mama was pure and without sin. God would save her. Chapter 32 Judgment Day Nobody understood me and what I was trying to do. Was no good trying to explain. Had to do it all on my own. I slipped away from Daddy, from Jory, from all those people who saw me as bad and unnecessary in their lives. I had come and I could go, and it would make no difference to anyone. They didn't know I was trying to help right all the wrongs they'd done before I was even born, and all those done after I was born. Sin. The world was full of sin and sinners. It wasn't my fault if Mama had to be punished. Though it did worry me some why God didn't want Daddy included in the punishment. John Amos had told me that men were meant for better things, 
heroic things like going off to war and doing brave deeds. No matter if legs and arms were shot off, it was a far, far better way to suffer than what God had in mind for women. I got to thinking hard on the subject. What if the pearly gates of heaven didn't open to receive my mamma's purified soul? Go forth and sin no more, I'd say, if I were God. I stamped my golden staff on heaven's golden floor and struck a huge boulder far below so it split wide open and I could write on it my twenty commandments. Ten weren't enough. Wonder how I could split open the Pacific and let all the righteous escape the heathens that were fast on their heels. Gee, thinking like this made me feel bad in my head, in my legs, and it made my hands and feet cold. Mama, why did you have to be so bad? Why did you have to go and live with your brother and put the burden of your death on me? Jory was outside my door, spying on me. Knew it was him. It was always him sneaking around, trying to find out what I was up to. I'd ignore him and concentrate on my mamma's last hours. She and Grandmother ought to have good food for their last meal. Every prisoner had her favourite meal before the end. Had to do right by my mamma and Grandmother. What did they like to eat most? I liked sandwiches best, so maybe they did too. Sandwiches, pie and ice cream should be just fine. Just as soon as everyone was in bed, I'd slip their last meal over to them. Black night came. All the lights were turned off. Soon everything was very, very quiet. What was that? Was it snoring I heard across the hall, in the guest room next to Jory's room? Oh, Madame Marisha snored. Disgusting. I slapped turkey between slabs of Emma's homemade cheese bread. With two slices of cherry pie and a quart of ice cream in my sack, I made my way to the white whale of a house, moving as quiet as a mouse. Down, down, down all the steep stairs into the cellar where rats, mice, and spiders roamed, and two women were moaning and groaning and calling for me. It made me feel important. I lifted the kitty door that was under the wine shelves and shoved in the sack with all the goodies. The light from the candle stub I'd given them was very dim, flickering, showing pale forms that didn't seem solid at all. My grandmother was trying to calm my mother, who raged on and on. Take your hands off me, Mrs. Winslow. For a while I felt like a child again, and I was glad you were with me in the dark, but now I remember. How much are you paying that butler to do this to me? Why are you here? Kathy, Kathy, John hit me over the head just like he did you. He hates me too. Didn't you hear all I explained? Yes, I heard. It was like a bad dream. All the same things Chris used to say to me trying to explain why you acted as you did. Even though he pretends to hate you, underneath it all I've always known he still loved you despite all you did. He kept a little of his faith in you, but he's stupid in his loyalty to women. First you, now me. I was glad I knew so many big words, so some day I could write in my own journal and tell everyone how I saved my mamma from hellfires. I could see straw in mamma's hair, which wasn't so pretty now. Same old straw that once was in the barn where Apple stayed. They hadn't even thanked me for making their prison softer and warmer with that hay, and shoved it all in while they were both sleeping. Kathy, don't you really love your brother? Have you just used him? My mamma seemed almost crazy as she struck out at my grandmother. Yes, I love him. You made me love him. It was your fault, and now we have to live ashamed and guilty, afraid any day our children will find out. And now they have, because of you. Because of John, whispered grandmother. I only came here to help, to be near you, to share just a little in your lives. But stop feeling guilty. Make it my shame and my guilt. I accept it as mine, all mine. You are right. You have always been right in your judgment of me, Kathy. I'm weak, foolish, and manage always to make the wrong decisions. I think they're right when I make them, but never do they prove anything but wrong. Mama quieted down. She sank back on her heels and stared at her mother. Your face. Why did you dig at your face? My grandmother bowed her head. She seemed to have aged ten years in one long, long day. 
I wanted to die after Bart died. I wanted to destroy my beauty so no man would ever want me again. I didn't want to look in a mirror and see you staring back at me, for I hated you too for a long time. It was Chris who came each summer and talked to me about you and made me see your side of your affair with my husband. He told me you really loved Bart, that you should have had Bart's child aborted for your own health, but you wouldn't have it done. You wanted to keep his baby. Kathy, thank you for doing that. Thank you for giving me another Bart, for he is mine as Jory will never be. Oh, they both loved me. Mama had risked her health to give me life. Grandmother had stopped hating Mama on account of me. I wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. Kathy, please forgive me, pleaded my granny. Say it, please say it at least once. I need so to hear you say it. It was Christopher who loved me, who defended me, but it was you who kept me awake at nights, tormenting me even on my honeymoon with Bart. It is your face, the faces of the twins, that haunt me still. Christopher will always be mine and yours, but give me back my daughter. My mother screamed, loud, shrill, crazy. She screamed over and over. She lunged at my grandmother and pounded her with her fists. No, I can never say what you want. She knocked the candle and it turned over and the hay caught on fire. Old newspaper they'd used to keep warm soon was ablaze and my grandmother and mother were beating at the flames with their bare hands trying to put it out. Bart, screamed my grandmother. If you're out there listening to us, run for help. Call the fire department. Tell your father. Do something quick, Bart, or your mother will die in this blaze. And God will never forgive you if you help John Amos kill us. What? Was I helping John Amos or God? I ran like mad up the cellar stairs and out into the garage, where John Amos was putting his bags in the last one of the black limousines. The other was gone, driving the maids to safety. He slammed down the trunk of the car, turned to me with a wide grin and said, Well, tonight is the night. At twelve o'clock sharp, remember that? Trip slowly down the stairs and into their place and light the string. That smelly string? Yes, it's soaked in gasoline. I didn't like the smell, so I threw it away. Didn't want their last meal to be eaten in a smelly place. What are you talking about? Have you been feeding them? He whirled as if to hit me, and then out of nowhere Jory sprang upon John Amos. The old man fell on his back with Jory astride, and then Daddy raced into the garage. Bart, we watched you make sandwiches and slice the pie and take the ice cream. Now where is your mother and your grandmother? Didn't know what to do. Dad, yelled Jory, I smell smoke. Where are they, Bart? John Amos yelled out at Daddy. Take that crazy kid away from here, him and his matches. He started a fire, him and his crazy stunts, like killing that dear little puppy who loved him so much. It's no wonder Corinne panicked and ran without telling me where she was going. He cried real tears and wiped at his runny nose. Oh, God, I wish to heaven we'd never come here to live. I told Corinne no good would come of this. Lies! He was telling lies on me. Wasn't none of that true? You did it all. You were the crazy man, John Amos. And like Malcolm would, I ran over to kick at him. Die, John Amos. Die and be redeemed through death. My arms were caught and I was lifted away. Daddy had me in his arms and was trying to calm me. Your mother, where is your mother? Where is the fire? A red haze was in my eyes, but I reached in my pants pocket and gave my daddy the key. In the wine cellar, I said dully, waiting for the fire to end them like they ended Foxworth Hall. Malcolm wanted it that way. All the little attic mice to burn and stop reproducing contaminated seed. Far away from my body, I was standing, watching the stunned terror in daddy's eyes as he tried to delve into my eyes. But I knew they were blank, for I wasn't there. Didn't know where I was. Didn't care.
Chapter 33 Redemption Fire! The mansion was on fire! I straddled John Amos, who fought me off, or tried to, but soon he knew who had the best of the battle. You can't get away, old man. You've poisoned my brother's mind, made him think awful things. I hope to God you rot in some jail cell for the rest of your life for what you've done. While John Amos and I had at it, Dad sped off to find Mom and his mother, with Bart at his heels, screaming out how he could get to the wine cellar. "'Get off me, boy!' yelled John Amos Jackson. "'That brother of yours is crazy, dangerous. He starved that poor puppy, then stabbed him with a pitchfork. Is that the act of a sane child? Why didn't you stop him if you saw him do all that?' "'Why, why!' sputtered the old man. "'He would have turned on me like a wild beast.' The boy is insane like his grandmother. Why, it was my own wife who saw him dig up the skeleton of her pet kitten. Ask her. Go on, ask her. Some of what he said was getting to me. Bart was irrational, yet... Yet, was he a killer? Bart talks in his sleep, old man. He repeats everything he hears during the day like a parrot. He quotes from the Bible and pronounces words he wouldn't be able to if someone like you wasn't coaching him. You fool boy, he doesn't know who he is. Can't you see that? He thinks he is his great-grandfather, Malcolm Foxworth. And like Malcolm, he's driven to kill every last living member of the Foxworth clan. At that moment, I saw my father stumble into the garage, carrying my mother in his arms, with his mother, dirty and in rags, following behind. I jumped up and ran. Mom! Oh, Mom! I cried, overjoyed to see she was still alive. But she looked dreadful, dirty, pale and thin, but alive, thank God. She was conscious. "'Where's Bart?' she whispered. With that question she lost consciousness and slumped in Dad's arms. While looking around for Bart I noticed that John Amos Jackson was no longer to be seen. "'Dad,' I said, to draw his attention." And just then, out of the dim shadows of the garage, the butler appeared with a heavy shovel. He brought that shovel down hard on top of Dad's head. Silently, without a groan, Dad slumped to the floor, with Mom still in his arms. Again that butler raised the shovel as if to kill Dad, and maybe Mom too. I ran, and I kicked with my right leg as I'd never kicked before. The shovel went spinning away, and as John Amos Jackson whirled to face me, I let him have it with my left foot square in his stomach. He groaned and slumped over. But Bart! Where was Bart? Jory, called the mother of my parents, get your parents out of this garage as quickly as you can. Pull them so far away they won't be hurt if the garage blows when the fire reaches the gasoline in here. Hurry! I started to object, but she took care of that. I'll find Bart. You just keep my son and daughter safe. It was easy to pick up Mom and run with her to a safe place and lay her down, but not so easy to drag Dad by his shoulders to lie beside her under a tree. Still, I managed. The house now smoked from several windows. My brother was in there, and my grandmother, too. John Amos Jackson had recovered, and he, too, rushed inside the burning house. In the kitchen I saw John Amos struggling with my grandmother. He was battering her face with slaps. I ran to rescue her, though the smoke was in my eyes. "'You'll never get away with this, John,' she yelled as he tried to choke her. I fell over a chair that had been turned over, and jumped to my feet just in time to see her bring down a heavy Venetian glass ashtray so it struck him on his temple. He slumped to the floor like a bird shot down from a rifle. That's when I saw Bart. He was in the parlour trying to lug that huge portrait to safety. Mama! He was sobbing. Got to save Mama! Mama, I'm going to get you out of here, don't you fear? Cos I'm just as brave as Jory. Just as brave. Can't let you burn. John Amos was lying. He doesn't know what God wants. Doesn't know. Bart! crooned my grandmother. Her voice was so like my mum's. I'm here. You can save me, not just the portrait. She stepped forward, limping badly, and I guessed she'd tripped and sprained her ankle, for at each step she grimaced. Please, darling, you and I have to leave the house. He shook his head. Got to save Mama. You're not my Mama. 
But I am, said another voice in another doorway. My eyes widened to see my mother standing there, clinging weakly to the door frame as she pleaded with Bart. Leave this house. Bart looked from her to his grandmother, still clinging to the huge, heavy portrait that he could never have the strength to drag from the house. Gonna save my mamma even if she hates me, muttered Bart to himself as he tugged at the huge, heavy portrait. Don't care no more if she loves Jory and Cindy better. Got to do one good thing and then everybody will know I'm not bad and not crazy. Mom ran to him and covered his small, dirty face with kisses as all around us the room filled with smoke. Jory, called my grandmother. Call the fire department. Take Bart out of here and I'll lead your mother out. But Mom didn't want to go. She seemed oblivious of the danger of staying in a smoke-filled house with fire underneath. Even as I dialed O for the operator and told her what was going on, then gave her the address, Mom was down on her knees, hugging Bart close. Bart, my sweetheart, if you can't accept Cindy as your sister and live happily with her, I'll send her away. His grip loosened on the portrait as his eyes grew wider. No, you won't. Yes, I swear I will. You are my son, born from my love for your father. You loved my real daddy? he asked unbelievingly. You really did love him, even if you seduced and killed him? I groaned, then ran to seize hold of Bart. Come on, let's get out of here while we have the chance. Bart, you go with Jory, called my grandmother, and I'll take care of my daughter. There was the side door Bart used to sneak inside the house, and I dragged him toward that, looking back to see Mom was being pulled along by her mother. Mom seemed on the verge of fainting, so my grandmother almost had to carry her. As I ran from the house, forcing Bart to join Dad under the tree where I'd left him, I saw Mom had sagged in her mother's arms. When she did, both women tumbled over backward, and for a moment the smoke obscured them. "'Oh, my God, is Kathy still in that house?' asked Dad, still wiping at the blood which wouldn't stop flowing from the deep gash on the side of his head. "'Mama's gonna die! I know it!' cried Bart, racing toward the house and forcing me to run after him. I hurled myself forward and brought him down with a tackle. He fought me like a madman. "'Mama! Gotta save Mama! Jory, let me! Please let me!' "'You don't have to. Her mother is going to save her,' I said, looking over my shoulder as I held him down and prevented him from entering that house of fire again. Suddenly Emma and Madame Marisha were in the yard, holding to me, to Bart, hurrying us both toward Dad, who had managed to stand. Blindly, with his hands groping before him, he was headed toward the house, crying out, "'Cathy, where are you? Come out of that house! Cathy, I'm coming!' That's when Mama was shoved violently through one of the French doors that opened onto the patio. I ran forward to lift her up and carry her to Dad. "'Neither one of you has to die,' I said with a sob in my throat. "'Your mother has saved at least one of her children.' But cries and screams were in the air. My grandmother's black clothes were on fire. I saw her as one sees a nightmare trying to beat out the flames. "'Fall down and roll on the ground,' roared Dad, releasing my mom so quickly she fell. He ran toward his mother, seized her up, and rolled her on the ground. She was gasping and choking as he slapped out the fire. One long, wild look of terror she gave him, before some kind of peace came over her face, and stayed there. Why did that expression just stay there? Dad cried out, then leaned to put his ear to her chest. Mama, he sobbed, please don't be dead before I've had the chance to say what I must. Mama, don't be dead. But she was dead. Even I could tell that from the glazed way her eyes kept staring up at a starry winter night sky. Her heart, said Dad with a dazed look, just like her father had. It seemed her heart was about to jump from her chest as I rolled her about. And now she's dead. But she died saving her daughter. Chapter 34 Jory 
all the shadows that clouded my youthful days, all the questions and the doubts I'd been afraid to speak about, all have been cleared away now, like cobwebs from the corners. I thought, when we came back from the funeral of our grandmother, that life would go on as usual and nothing much would be changed. Some things have changed. Some weight lifted from Bart's shoulders, and he became again the quiet, meek little boy who couldn't really like himself very much. His psychiatrist said he would grow out of that gradually, with enough love given him, and enough friends his own age to play with. Even as I write this, I can look through the open window and see Bard playing with the Shetland pony our parents gave him for Christmas. At last, he had his heart's desire. I watch him often, the way he looks at the pony, the way he stares at the St. Bernard puppy my daddy gave him too. Then he turns his head and stares over at the ruins of the mansion. He never speaks of her, the grandmother of our lost summer. We never speak the name of John Amos Jackson, nor mention apple or clover. We can't risk the health and happiness of one unstable little boy trying to find his way in a world that isn't always like a fairy tale. We passed a true Arab woman on the street the other day. Bart turned around to stare after her, wistful longing in his dark, dark eyes. I know now that whatever else she was, Bart loved her, so she couldn't have been as awful as I think when I read Mom's book. She made Bart love her, even as John Amos took a vulnerable child and warped him. And so John Amos got what he deserved, and like my grandmother he too lies dead in his grave, way back in Virginia, the home of his ancestors who settled in what history books call the Lost Colony. All his plotting and scheming was for nothing. If, wherever he is, he can think, I wonder what he thinks and feels, knowing what was in the will my grandmother left. Did he turn over in his grave when the lawyer told us that our grandmother had left the entire Foxworth estate to Jory, Janice Marquette, Bartholomew Scott Winslow Sheffield, and, surprisingly enough, Cynthia Jane Nichols too would get her share? and none of us were legally her blood kin. Legally. All that money held in trust for us until we reached the age of twenty-five. All held in trust. My father and mother, the administrators. We could live in splendor if we chose, or if my parents chose, but we live on in the same redwood house with the marble statues out back, and every year the garden grows more lush. Bart keeps himself exceptionally clean now. He will not lie down to sleep at night until his room is in complete order, everything precisely placed. My parents look at each other when he insists on doing this, and I see fear in their eyes, making me wonder if Malcolm Neal Foxworth was exceptionally clean and neat. Bart laid down the law to my mother and father one morning soon after Christmas had come and gone, and he had his pony. If you are to keep Cindy, then you can no longer live together as man and wife and contaminate my life with your sinning. You have to sleep in my room, Daddy, and Mama has to sleep alone for the rest of her life. Neither one of my parents said anything. They just looked at him until he flushed and turned away, murmuring, I'm sorry. I'm not Malcolm, am I? I'm just me. Nobody much. Bart is a true Foxworth over and over, for he will rule again, so he says, in the new Foxworth Hall that he will build. And you can dance your head off until you are forty, he yelled at me when he was angry because I petted his new pony, but you won't be as rich as I'll be. At forty I'll be able to buy and sell you ten times over, for dancing legs won't matter when you grow old and brains count more, a million times more. I'll be the greatest actor the world has ever known, he stated arrogantly, turning from meek to aggressive just because he was holding that red journal book in his hands. And when I'm done with the stage and screen, I'll turn my talent to the business world, and everybody who didn't respect me as an actor will stand up and applaud my genius for making money. Acting. That's all he was doing again, 
for he was only a little boy who seldom spoke except to himself. And yet, sometimes, when I lie awake at night thinking about all that happened before he and I were born, there must be some reason for all that went before. Out of the ruins should come the roses, right? I worry about all the women Bart would step on to get his way. Would he be as ruthless as our great-grandfather just to obtain an even greater fortune? And how many would suffer because of one eventful summer, fall and winter in the year I was fourteen? I'll take him by the hand tomorrow and lead him out into the garden, and together we'll stand before the copy of Rodin for Kiss, and maybe then he'll realize that God planned for men and women to love in a physical way, and it's not sinful, only natural. I pray that some day Bart will see life my way, that love, no matter what its form or how it comes wrapped, is worth the price no matter how high. Between the choice of love or money, I'll take love, but first comes dancing. And when Bart is old and grey and he sits in Foxworth Hall counting his billions, I'll sit with my wife and family, content with the happy memories of how it used to be when I was young, graceful, handsome, on stage with the foots in my eyes, the sound of applause in my ears, and I'll know I fulfilled my destiny. I, Jory Janus Marquette, will carry on the family tradition. Chapter 35 the last chapter. Bart. They don't know or understand me any more than they did before. Jory looks at me with pity, like I'm different from the rest of the human race. He feels sorry that I don't like his kind of music, or any kind of music, and colours don't paint pictures in my brain or make music in the air. He thinks I will never find joy in anything. But I'll find a way to enjoy... I'll know the future that is right for me, for that was the true reason God sent my grandmother and John Amos and Malcolm to me, like the fates come to lead the way. They came to show me how to save my parents from the everlasting fires of hell. I watch my mama and daddy night and day and sneak into their room at night, fearing to catch them doing something wicked. But they only sleep in each other's arms, and to my relief, her eyes don't move rapidly behind her closed lids. She doesn't have nightmares any more. I see my daddy's eyes at the breakfast table, looking bluer than ever, for he has let go of his stranglehold on his sister. I have saved them. So, Jory pities me. But one day, when we're both older wiser and I have found the right words, I'll tell him something Malcolm wrote in his book. There has to be darkness, if there is to be light. Epilogue I remember so much of what went on before we flew to Green Glenna to bury my mother beside her second husband. It was Bart who insisted that his grandmother had to lie in eternal sleep beside his father, his real father, Bartholomew Winslow. We cried, all of us, even Emma and Madame Marisha, and I never hoped to see the day when Madame would cry for a member of my family. When the first clod of damp earth struck her coffin in its grave, it took me back to when I was twelve years old and Daddy was in his grave, and Mama was holding fast to my hand and to Chris's, and each twin held on to an older brother or sister. And only when I heard the dirt hit her mahogany casket did I cry out something I'd withheld for so long, too long. It came from the depths of me, tearing away the years and making me a child again and needing, so needing to hold on to my parents. Mama, I forgive you. I forgive you, I still love you. Can you hear me now where you are? God, please let her know I forgive her. I sobbed then and fell into my brother's arms. I would have said more to her on her burial day, but Bart was there, glaring his dark eyes at me, commanding me to be strong, to let go of the man I loved. 
But how could I, when to do so would destroy him? We still live in the house next to the ruins of the mansion where my mother died in her efforts to save my life. But it's not like it used to be before she came, with her evil butler who filled Bart's head with his crazy beliefs and gave Bart that journal of Malcolm Foxworth. I love Bart. God knows I love him. But when I see those dark, merciless eyes in the shadows, I cringe and wonder why I needed revenge so much when I had Chris to save me. Last night, Jory and Melody danced an astonishingly beautiful performance of Romeo and Juliet. I trembled to see Bart cynically smiling, as if he'd lived a century or more, and he'd seen all this happen before, and it would be him who got everything he wanted in the end, as Bart has always found a way to make himself the centre of attention. He steals into our bedroom at night, having taught himself how to pick locks, and stares down at Chris and me, while I feign sleep, holding still, breathless until he is gone, so terribly afraid that the evil that lived in Malcolm will live again in my youngest son, and sooner or later history will repeat itself. Today the mail brought a letter from my literary agent, I whispered to Madame M, while Jory and Melody changed from costumes to street clothes. She's found a publisher who's made me an offer on my book, the first one, not a fortune, but I'm going to accept. Madame gave me another of those long, speculative looks that had once made me feel very uneasy and vulnerable, as if she could see through me. Yes, Catherine, you will do what you must, regardless of the consequences or the protests I make or anyone makes. I knew who she meant, for he glared at me, telling me I should keep my secrets to myself and not let the whole world know. But Bart cannot rule my every action. You will be rich and famous in a different way than I expected when you were fifteen, continued Madame, who was now my dearest confidant, for everything can come to those who have the desire, the drive, the dedication, and the determination. I smiled uneasily, afraid to look at Bart again, but fixed my eyes on my eldest son, who was the star of the evening. I knew for a certainty that when my books were published and all the skeletons were out of the Foxworth closets, I'd lay the shade and thwart the ghost of Malcolm Neil Foxworth, and never, never would he rise up to rule over me again. Nervously my hands fluttered up to my throat, to feel for those invisible pearls that used to adorn my mother's throat, but never mine, never mine. I said again to myself that it wouldn't hurt to give it a try. Evil did thrive in the dark shadows of lies. Evil could not possibly survive in the full, bright light of unstinting truth, as incredible as it may seem to some who won't believe. Shivering, I moved a bit farther from Bart, nearer to Chris, who put his arm about my shoulders as my arm encircled his waist, and I was safe, safe. Now I could look at Bart and smile. Now I could reach for Cindy's hand and try to reach for Bart's. But he drew away, refusing to join the chain I would form of our family, one for all and all for one. I'd like to conclude by saying I don't cry any more at night, that I don't have nightmares in which I see my grandmother climbing the stairs to try and witness evil deeds we didn't do. I want to write that I can only be grateful that from all the thorny stems the attic flowers managed to grow and produced at least a few roses, real roses, the kind that blossom in the sun. I'd like to conclude with that, but I can't. Nevertheless, I've grown old enough and wise enough to accept what gold coins are offered, and never, never will I turn over anything that glitters to look for the tarnish. Seek and you shall find. For some reason I glanced up then. Bart was sitting in a shadowy corner again, holding in his hands a red volume that appeared to be covered in leather with gold tooling. Silently he read, his lips moving as he mouthed the words of a great-grandfather he'd never seen. I shivered, for Malcolm's journal had burned in the fire. 
The book Bart held was a cheap imitation of leather, and every page was blank. Not that it mattered. This concludes the reading of If There Be Thorns by V.C. Andrews. This book was read by Donada Peters.